Ahead on Red and Blue, Democrats block their own members' impeachment push against President Trump after his racist tweets over the weekend. Also tonight, Obamacare or Medicare for All. The Democratic health insurance battle heats up. And I would venture to say that more women are going to come out and vote for Donald Trump in 2020 than 2016. President Trump's 2020 campaign makes a new push for women voters. We'll look at the campaign strategy. Hi, everybody. I'm Tanya Rivero. Elaine Quijano will be with us in a moment. The House of Representatives tonight blocked a vote to impeach President Trump. The measure was proposed in response to the president's racist tweets over the weekend, targeting four freshman Democrats in the House. Chief Congressional Correspondent Nancy Cordes reports. Donald John Trump, President of the United States, is unfit to be president. It was a test vote of sorts on the appetite for impeachment. And it turns out the hunger is low. No, I think we'll get rid of all this right now. More than half of House Democrats joined all Republicans to table the idea for now. I do think I'm winning the political fight. I think I'm winning it by a lot. Texas Democrat Al Green forced the vote by introducing an impeachment resolution. It says the president's racist comments this week, suggesting those who may look to the president like immigrants should go back to other countries, qualify as high misdemeanors. If you did what the president has done, you would be punished. The president was referring to these four Democratic congresswomen um, who spoke to Gail King. So what is the point of going through the exercise of impeachment when it doesn't look like it will go anywhere? The Watergate class didn't have the votes in the Senate side. They didn't function from that place. They function in putting the country first. But Democratic leaders prefer to wait. And for now, most party members appear to be with them. We have six committees that are working on uh, following the facts in terms of uh, any abuse of power, obstruction of justice and the rest uh, that the president may have engaged in. Nancy Cordes joins me now from Capitol Hill. Hi, Nancy. So opening up an impeachment inquiry is exactly what Democratic leadership has been advising against. So is there any mm -hmm. sense of relief on Capitol Hill now that the vote is over? Sure. In fact, uh, House Republicans even helped them out by taking the lead in uh, a vote to table that resolution here on Capitol Hill. So uh, Democratic leaders didn't have to take the step of looking like they were trying to shut down their own progressive members because there is uh, certainly some energy around the idea of uh, impeachment proceedings or at the very least an impeachment inquiry. But the fact remains, Tanya, that uh, this vote showed that more than half of House Democrats are content, uh, just like leadership is, to wait for now. You've got six congressional committees that are conducting investigations. Uh, those investigations appear to be moving along. You've got special counsel Robert Mueller set to testify before two of those committees next week. And so even uh, Democrats who support the idea of an impeachment inquiry were a little wary about uh, about this impeachment resolution going to the floor uh, after it was introduced by uh, Al Green of Texas because they just don't think the timing is right. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they like the idea of pursuing impeachment, but just not right now. Just not right now. Well, on Tuesday, Nancy, a different resolution did pass, uh, the one to condemn the president's comments. We only saw four Republicans break right. rank. What was their reasoning, even though a lot more than those four came out and, and spoke out against the president's tweets? Right. It's very interesting. We've been talking to some of those Republicans. Some of them had criticized the president quite harshly and had said uh, point blank that, that they were uh, upset by his comments, that they felt that what he said was out of line, inappropriate, and yet they voted against this House resolution. And what one of them, uh, Congressman Mitchell of Michigan, told me was that, um, you know, he didn't feel that this resolution was necessary. He felt that it was a partisan endeavor and that uh, he made his criticism known directly to the president, to the president's aides. And so he, he didn't feel that he needed to get behind uh, the House resolution. And, and certainly GOP leaders had been urging their members not to vote in favor of the resolution. Um, and they wanted to keep the party together. And, and for the most part, they succeeded. And so I asked uh, the House Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, 
what she thinks was gained from this entire exercise if at the end of the day it ended up being essentially a party line vote. And she said um, that they had hoped that more Republicans would join them, uh, but perhaps that hope was misplaced um, and that she still felt that it was important for everyone to go on the record about whether they felt that the president should be condemned for these comments or not. Right. And meanwhile, Nancy, the House voted Wednesday to hold Attorney General William Barr and Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross in criminal contempt it's right. over the Trump administration's efforts to add a citizenship question to the 2020 census. And so remind us, why were Democrats specifically looking mm -hmm. into these officials? What did they want to know from them? Sounds bad, right, to hold somebody in criminal contempt, but the reality is that this is probably a legal dead end for Democrats because uh, Attorney General William Barr controls the Department of Justice, which uh, is the department that would, uh, that would pursue these uh, legal charges against him. So that probably isn't going anywhere. But, but, but what, in, in response to your question, what Democrats were seeking here um, were documents pertaining to the U.S. Census. They wanted to better understand how this question about citizenship came to be um, included in the census for the first in the first place. Now, uh, that's it's been struck down. That question is not going to appear uh, on the census after a ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court. But uh, Democrats have always argued that it was politics uh, that was behind this question, that the, it was meant to dissuade immigrants from answering the census in the first place um, and that that would tip the scales of redistricting and, and other funding measures in Republicans' favor because those voters tend to be uh, supporters of Democrats. And so they want to know more about uh, who had these conversations in the first place about putting this question on the census, and they felt like they were really being stonewalled by the Department of Justice and the Commerce Department. They say that they know those documents, those emails exist, but they're not being handed over. And so that's why they took this step even after the Justice Department's and, and the Justice and Commerce Department's urged them at the last minute to hold off on this vote. And the, the legal challenges, I'm sure, will continue down that road. Well, Nancy Cordes on Capitol Hill, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. CBS News visited the southern border Wednesday and was given exclusive access to the largest migrant processing facility in the country. Cameras captured firsthand children lying on blankets on the floor. CBS Evening News anchor Nora O'Donnell sat down with Acting Secretary of Homeland Security Kevin McAleenan to discuss what more needs to be done and spoke to a mother and her son who recently crossed the border. Where are you from? Yes, Venezuela. Venezuela? Sí. And you traveled the whole way with your son? Sola. Sí, sola. Me dejaron botar en la selva. Tuve que caminar mucho, 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 mucho. A lot of walking. Yeah, a lot of walking. Mm -hmm. you... Angelina Estrada and her two year old son Martin is just one of the 815 families here. A journalist who says she was threatened by the Venezuelan government and knows the law that as a mother with a child, she will be allowed to enter the United States. Are you getting warm food? But you're sleeping on the floor. It's extraordinary to see mothers and their children sleeping together on the floor in this 77,000 square foot facility. The toughest thing to see? These infants, alone, napping mid-morning in this makeshift nursery. They are just some of the nearly 300 unaccompanied children here. Without parents, they are being cared for by members of the Coast Guard. This is the, the whole 55,000 yes. square foot yeah, part. We just walked it the is. whole perimeter. We just, you, you just went around the entire perimeter. And, and was so. any of this cleaned up or dressed up for us? Yeah. No. Absolutely not. We had exclusive access to this facility. There was no one we weren't allowed to speak with and nowhere we couldn't go. This is not like anything I've ever seen before. We were here with Kevin McAleenan, acting secretary of Homeland Security. 
Also with us, Carmen Qualia, the chief border patrol agent who runs the facility in the Rio Grande Valley. Have you ever let cameras inside here before, like this? No. no. I made the decision uh, to take the risk and, and bring cameras in to be transparent about what we're facing and, and to show that to the American people and, and make sure that our Congress knows what we need to help us address this crisis. You realize this may cause more criticism of what's going on here? I, I think we need a national conversation mm -hmm. based on the facts that are actually happening on our border to try to address and solve the problems. A year ago, the country was shocked by still photos showing children being held in overcrowded cages. Today, it is cleaner and more well organized, but it is still hard to look at. I mean, you're the acting secretary. Right. And you're saying this is not good enough. I, I've been saying it for a year. The conditions for families there are much different than at the McAllen Border Patrol Station for adults, where Vice President Mike Pence visited last week. We're here at the McAllen Border Station. It's the busiest there is, right? Right. How is it that they just got shower units last week? So that, that's been a result of lack of funding uh, to provide all the services that we'd like to provide. We prioritize children, obviously. We prioritize families, second. Uh, and single adults are, are the third to get that kind of humanitarian support. So you're blaming some of the past conditions on Congress's lack of funding. It's been a critical issue. McAleenan says the solution is this so-called tent city named Donna, which is expanding. He says it is far better suited to house new migrants. It, it just provides a lot more capacity. Uh, the big challenge with the overcrowding is, is people are uncomfortable because there's too many in small areas. We're going to be able to reduce that. Up next, Elaine Quijano takes over. She'll be looking at Senator Bernie Sanders' major address on his single-payer Medicare for All bill. She'll break down his vision for health care. You're streaming Red and Blue. What the debate that we are currently having in this campaign and all over this country has nothing to do with health care, but it has everything to do with the greed and profits of the health care industry. That was Senator Bernie Sanders defending his support for Medicare for All by criticizing the health care industry. The 2020 presidential hopeful wants all Democratic candidates to reject any contributions from executives and lobbyists from the drug or insurance industries. He also called the United States current health care system an international embarrassment. Joining me now on set is CBSN political reporter Caitlin Huey Burns. Caitlin, thanks so much for being with us. So why is Bernie Sanders focusing on the health care industry and his Medicare for All push? Well, he wants to paint the health care industry uh, the same way that he does corporations and businesses, which is to say, look, these are uh, people, as he called out some of the heads by name, who are getting big tax breaks, all the while you are uh, funding um, more than you should for your health care costs. And he is trying to put the pressure on the other Democrats in this race. You mentioned his push uh, on the donations, but he's also trying to, you know, we've seen him slip in the polls a little bit. We've seen other candidates like Elizabeth Warren, who also embraces the plan, uh, a rise in the polls and rise uh, on the ground. He wants to kind of reestablish himself as the leader on this issue. And so he's going after the insurance industry itself, uh, which is unpopular. Uh, the industry itself that is unpopular, and he's trying to put the pressure back on his fellow running, uh, his fellow candidates. Well, in your reporting on Medicare for All back in January, you cited some data from the Kaiser Family Foundation, which found a majority of Americans support Medicare for All, but once you add in details about how to pay for it, such as eliminating private insurance or raising taxes, the approval rating plummets. So mm -hmm. how are Democratic candidates adjusting to that? Well, there's a real debate in the party right now. You have Joe Biden, for example, arguing uh, to keep Obamacare in place and build upon it with something like a public option. Uh, then you have Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and several of the senators running who have endorsed Bernie Sanders' plan, uh, saying that Medicare for all is the ideal goal here, and that's something that they want to get to. It is 
popular, as you see from that polling, but when you drill down on the details, people get very concerned about anything that would change their private insurance, mm -hmm. uh, change their current Medicare coverage, uh, anything that would potentially increase taxes, or anything that would uh, put uh, their current system at risk. And we saw that in 2010, uh, when Democrats passed the, the Affordable Care Act, we saw a negative reaction to Democrats for that, because anytime you make changes to he an, a health care program, that gets people anxious, mm -hmm. rightfully so, because it's, it's a huge, tangible issue for them. Uh, we saw now 10 years later, Obamacare is extremely popular, and some of the Democrats, like Joe Biden, are trying to say, look, let's build upon that, uh, while arguing that Republicans want to take it away. Right. People get nervous about mm -hmm. change because if they're sort of barely cobbling things right. together, you talk about changing things and that can right. be frightening for some people. So fellow 2020 candidate Senator Kamala Harris was on CNN this morning to discuss mm -hmm. health care. She said she supports Medicare for all, but not a middle class tax hike. And Harris was asked how she'd pay for her plan. Part of it is going to have to be about Wall Street paying more. It's going to have to be about looking at how we and what we tax in terms of financial services. That's part of it. But the other part of it is to understand that this is about an investment which will reap a great return on the investment. Um, if we can't only look at this issue in terms of cost without thinking about benefit. The benefit to the American public will be that people will have access to health care that right now they cannot afford. So what's the reality here? I mean, even Senator Sanders concedes that his mm -hmm. Medicare for all plan would require a middle class tax hike. So mm -hmm. do experts think that Senator Harris's plan is realistic? Well, they wonder how much revenue that could actually raise enough to cover. And from what they've seen, uh, it doesn't quite meet that mark. And that's why Bernie Sanders himself has talked about the need to uh, increase taxes even on the middle class to pay for it. And the way that Bernie Sanders framed it in his speech earlier today was to say, look, their premiums are going up. Health care is already expensive. They would rather, uh, you know, pay into a system to get more better access to health care and to get health care coverage. And he had a line kind of saying nobody uh, is excited to pay their premiums. <laughs> um, and so that's he's not kind of how he's that, framing yeah. <laughs> the, the argument here. But then you have Democrats. I mentioned Joe Biden, also Michael Bennett and you know John Delaney, some others saying, look, uh, this is really expensive to do. It's not realistic. They've pointed to uh, how this has worked or not worked, I should say, in states, including Vermont, including California, uh, where it just wasn't feasible economically economically. And they also are saying, look, just getting something like this through the Senate, uh, through Congress, is a monumental task. And so they want to play kind of the realism card here. On the other hand, you have a Democratic base that is really concerned with access to health care coverage, figuring out ways to, for them to pay for it. Um, and that is really at the heart of the party right now. So former Vice President Joe Biden was also asked his opinion of a public option on health care this Monday. Let's listen. Can you imagine what Med Medicare for all, if you think that's tough? Come on, look, here's the deal, guys. One of the things that's happened is all of a sudden the American public has figured out what Obamacare was about. They've got it. They understand it. That's why we went into, I told you, I went into 24 states for all those candidates. We won on that. They didn't know what it was. They understand now, and they embrace it. And it's a place from which to build. It's solid. It's real. It's consequential. <clears throat> we can, in fact... For a significant portion of the price, we can, in fact, insure 97, 98 percent of all the American people who want to be insured. And they can keep their policy if they want with their employer. So, Caitlin, what is Joe Biden's strategy when it comes to the health care debate? Well, he's trying to say, look, Democrats, we finally got to a place that Obamacare is not a political liability right. for us. It's actually a benefit. So let's build on it. Joe Biden, we should note, is really running on the Obama legacy. And so this uh, is an argument that makes sense for him. The other Democrats supporting Medicare for all take that argument and say, yes, exactly. That's why we can make Medicare for all uh, as popular as Obama uh, care became or the Affordable Care Act became. And they're also uh, those who are supportive of Medicare for all are pointing to uh, the efforts by the Trump administration to continue to try to dismantle Obamacare. So they are speaking to or trying to speak to voters who are concerned about having this taken away. And they believe this kind of system will fortify that. 
Biden, however, is saying, no, look, let's let's build on this. And he's been trying to present himself as someone who is somewhat of a consensus builder, can work with Congress. And there are some people in the Democratic Party that thinks that that's not possible. So Democrats retook the House, of course, in 2018 by emphasizing health care. How do Speaker Nancy Pelosi, the DCCC and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer feel about this health care battle among the 2020 Democrats? Well, they know that it did help them win the majority in 2018, and they know this still remains a top concern for voters. We're seeing that in polling. We're seeing that in our reporting on the ground. This comes up over and over again. And now they want to focus on some of the details of that. So while they're having this kind of larger debate in the party about a universal health care system, about potentially a single payer type of health care system, they want to address some of the um, cause or some of the, the, the causes of rising health care costs, particularly prescription drugs. And they want to address this as an economic issue because they're also coming at this of, you know, look, the economy looks good, um, but it's not working for everybody. That's their argument. And health care is such a big component of that because it is such a big part of, of the family budget, of anxiety, how to pay for it, how to get access to it. Right. Uh, and it goes on. Yeah, every day. President Trump held a re-election rally tonight in Greenville, North Carolina. North Carolina is a state the president carried in 2016 by three points over Hillary Clinton. I spoke earlier with Nick Oxner, a reporter with our Charlotte affiliate WBTV, about the president's visit to the Tar Heel State. It was a narrow victory for the president in North Carolina in 2016. We know the Republican National Convention will take place in Charlotte next year. How important is this state to Mr. Trump's reelection hopes? Well, it's very important. One of the key battleground states, you could easily say, is uh, so important. In fact, I mean, look at this rally that he's holding is the first campaign rally President Trump has held since formally uh, kicking off his reelection campaign down in Florida. Um, we also saw today an announcement from the RNC. They announced their um, North Carolina state leadership, both the staff that they plan to have on the ground supporting President Trump's reelection campaign, as well as their long list of, of um, a volunteer committee made up of very um, senior prominent elected officials across the state. So they're putting a lot of emphasis very early on just how important North Carolina is going to be. So, uh, Nick, this rally, of course, comes as the House has voted to condemn President Trump's recent Twitter attacks against four congresswomen of color. How are voters reacting to this controversy? Is it on their radar at all? This is not something that I've heard a, a terribly lot about. Um, of course, the interesting thing about North Carolina and really what makes it a swing state is that you have a mix of largely rural or maybe suburban areas, and then you have pretty densely populated areas, uh, uh, urban areas around the big cities like Raleigh, where I am now, like Charlotte, where I work, uh, Chapel Hill, Greensboro. And so, of course, if you're around those bigger areas, people have heard about it, people are talking about it a little bit more than they are in the largely Republican voter base in the rural parts of the state, especially eastern North Carolina and Greenville, where President Trump Trump is visiting tonight. And, and so largely it would uh, track based on what part of the state you're in, uh, what the reaction is going to be like. But again, it, it's, it's pretty divided and that's what makes this a pretty purple state. So a few North Carolina Republicans are expected to attend the campaign event tonight. One of them is Senator Tom Tillis. He is up for re-election as well next year. What are you hearing about his chances in 2020? Sure. So he's in for a fight first because he has a primary challenger, a guy named Garland Tucker, a North Carolina businessman who's never run for elected office before, but but has spent a lot of time in the private sector. And campaign finance reports uh, out just recently showed dumped seven hundred thousand dollars into his campaign in the last financial fundraising quarter. Uh, so first, he has a, a, a fairly a uh, good, tough challenge in the primary from Garland Tucker, and that's forcing Tom Tillis to go uh, to his right. He was Speaker of the State House before he was elected to the U.S. Senate. Uh, he was largely a moderate Republican, but he's had to go a little bit to the right. He infamously uh, flip-flopped on, on border funding, border wall in the Senate. Uh, and then he's going to run against Cal Cunningham. Uh, if he can survive his primary, he's got to face off against Cal Cunningham, a Democrat, who's uh, the leading front runner, uh, who's a formidable candidate. He can raise the money. He is raising the money and has run for office before. Interesting. Well, Senator Tillis said that he hopes the president makes the economy a focal point of his rally. Where does the economy rank in terms of issues most important to voters in North Carolina? 
Sure, that's very important. And if you look at the body of polling across North Carolina, voters feel generally comfortable with the economy right now, even if they don't necessarily feel that either the country or the state is on the right track. And so if you're Senator Tillis, that's a good issue that, that works for your moderate platform. It's also an issue that you know voters feel good right now. The North Carolina economy is great. The housing market's booming. Jobs continue to come into the state. The tax rate's lower. Um, and so that's definitely a winning issue for people like Tom Tillis and, and even for other people like uh, President Trump. So on another topic, last week, Dr. Greg Murphy defeated Dr. Joan Perry in the Republican primary runoff for the third district seat. It's been vacant since February after the death of Congressman Walter Jones. What did we learn from this result? Well, it was really kind of a pit against um, candidates who represent two sides of the Republican Party. So a lot of observers have said um, uh, Greg Murphy, who won the election, won the runoff primary, uh, really had the same campaign apparatus and a lot of campaign supporters of Walter Jones. Walter Jones, probably most famous for being a Republican who voted against going into Iraq. Um, and kind of struck a moderate chord in his time in, in, uh, in Congress. He represented a northeastern North Carolina seat. Uh, Greg Murphy, a doctor, he's actually been pushing uh, for a program that looks an awful lot like but isn't quite Medicaid expansion in North Carolina. Um, and so he, he was able to win. It started as a very crowded primary, had that runoff, and, and now he's on to the general election. Interesting. Well, Nick, I also want to ask you about gerrymandering in North Carolina. There was a case in the state court challenging the state's legislative maps, and this comes after the Supreme Court ruled the federal judiciary cannot get involved with claims of partisan gerrymandering. What more do we know about this case? Yeah, absolutely. And that ruling where the Supreme Court said, look, guys, this isn't really our issue to decide at the federal level involved North Carolina gerrymandering. And they said back to you guys in the states. Mm -hmm. And so that case in the Supreme Court, this case in North Carolina, both brought by a group called Common Cause. Uh, and their reaction a couple weeks ago to the U.S. Supreme Court was that's fine. We'll handle this in state court now. Uh, largely at issue here is how the, the maps were drawn and the process used to draw those maps uh, that's in trial right now being held before a panel of three judges. It started on Monday and uh, observers on both sides say, look, regardless of what this three judge panel decides at the trial level, it's going to go on to the North Carolina Supreme Court. That's what everyone expects. The North Carolina Supreme Court made up by six Democrats, one Republican, including most recently elected Justice Anita Earls, who had previously made a name for herself fighting some of these very same issues. So it looks like if, if uh, you put your prognosticator hat on, uh, that if this goes to the North Carolina Supreme Court, that Democrat majority would probably rule in favor of some sort of, um, of something that takes away advantage from the Republicans. Hmm. All right, Nick Oxner for us. Nick, always great to have your insight. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up after a break, we'll talk to the chair of the Texas Democratic Party about the state's growing role in picking the 2020 nominee. You're streaming Red and Blue. House lawmakers have voted not to take up articles of impeachment against President Trump. The vote failed 332 to 95. Most Democrats opposed the measure. The articles were originally introduced by Texas Democratic Congressman Al Green after President Trump's Twitter attacks on minority congresswomen over the weekend. It was the first time articles of impeachment had been introduced since Democrats took back control of the House in January. The vote on articles of impeachment came after a different resolution passed the House last night, condemning the tweets. This afternoon, our chief congressional correspondent, Nancy Cordes, spoke with Michigan Republican Congressman Paul Mitchell. Mitchell spoke out against President Trump's tweets, saying, quote, we must be better than comments like these. But Mitchell did not vote for last night's resolution. Congressman, uh, first off, you've talked about this, but tell me what you thought of the president's remarks. Well, I thought the president's remarks were beneath the leadership that we need uh, and, and don't contribute simply to uh, moving things forward. Uh, I've talked a lot about civility. If, you're going, if you disagree, especially when you disagree with someone, you've got to be civil in the process. And I think calling out individuals, especially based on identity politics, do not help us here in moving forward issues that are important. We just talked about immigration, which is critically important. We've got issues of health care 
prescription for drug cost. We've got uh, issues on USMCA, getting trade issues taken care of. We've got a lot of things to do here in the House, mm -hmm. and spending all the time we spent on this little drama the last few days simply doesn't contribute to doing that. So uh, I spoke out about that on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I've talked to senior staff at the White House. They shared my statement with the President. I've asked for 15 or 20 minutes with the President to talk with them about what I consider to be some needs that we have to move things forward and focus on policies and issues and not personalities. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't have voting for a resolution to condemn him have sent that message as well? No, I, well, first, I think standing up separately. I, I stood up very early on and said, wait a minute, this is outside the, what I think is quality leadership, well before anybody else, I think, in the conference. Uh, I sent my statements over to talk to senior staff for a reason. I think standing up and not needing to forward it some other people to join me is the point. Mm -hmm. The other is, is the resolution itself violated the House rules. Speaker Pelosi, when she spoke on it, violated the House rules and had her words taken down by the parliamentarian. The Democrats had a vote to basically ignore the House rules. So all it was was more name-calling, more in uncivility or incivility, uh, which doesn't contribute again to solving the problem. Let's stop slinging mud. Let's call each other, call each other names. Let's focus on the problems we have. And that's why I joined the Problem Solvers Caucus uh, several months ago, was in fact to focus on that. And the partisan politics and the name-calling is destructive. Were you disappointed that your leaders decided to defend the president instead of send the message that you did by criticizing his remarks publicly? Well, in contrast to what some people think about political parties, everyone is entitled to have their own opinion on it. And there wasn't any whipping going on, and no one said to me, you should say this, you should say that. And I am a member of leadership. I'm the sophomore representative to the leadership team. No one said to me, hey, what are you doing? I let them know what my tweet was going to be. It wasn't a negotiation. No one asked me to change it. No one told anybody else what to do. In fact, they didn't whip the vote. You do what you need to do. How good is you express yourself? I have constituents at home that uh, believe we need to focus on issues and uh, less on identity politics. Some people assume because of what they see, they understand identity. My youngest son, we adopted him from Russia. He's now an American. Questioning someone's status in America troubles me. I am the oldest of seven kids. My, we, I was born in poverty. My dad built trucks in the line. First thing, every my extended family were to college. You know, people look at me and they say, well, you're a successful white male. You must have a special, you must have gotten a special gig. Well, guess what? Identity politics are destructive and not always accurate. And, and I think it's notable that you spoke out, but I guess my question is, do you think that the president really gets the message when the leadership of your party goes soft on him? I don't know if... Uh, I, I'm well aware that conversations were held by Kevin McCarthy and others with the president. I was not present for those. I am supposed to attend a breakfast tomorrow morning uh, that was scheduled last week at the uh, vice president's uh, home with leadership. Uh, I will again reinforce my concerns. Uh, I don't think it's been silent. People take different ways to express themselves. In my case, uh, I just couldn't pick up the phone and, and say, hey, are you kidding me? We need to fix this. So I sent a tweet, which is his favorite way of communicating, frankly. Uh, I know I do. Houston is set to host the third set of Democratic primary debates on September 12th and 13th. Texas Democratic Party Chair Alberto Hinojosa celebrated the choice, saying, quote, Texas is a battleground state, period. We know that when Texas goes blue, the White House will follow. And El Alberto Inojosa joins me now from Brownsville, Texas. Thank you so much for being with us. Why do you believe the historically red state of Texas is now a battleground state? Well, if you look at the results of 2018, um, it was quite clear that um, in the state of Texas, uh, in about four statewide elections, we came within a couple of three points of electing a Democrat. We picked up 12 seats in the House um, and came within a, a few points of taking over the House uh, and, and electing a Speaker. In Harris County, um, we, uh, we elected every single Democrat running countywide and by large margins. The, 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 the county of Tom DeLay, which is Fort Bend County that hasn't had a, Repub a Democratic elected official in 40 years, we elected every Democrat that was on the ballot. Um, and all across the state of Texas, you saw those kinds of results uh, where Democrats won in areas that we had not won in many, many years, including Fort Worth, which is the largest uh, um, Republican-controlled county in, uh, in the United States. Uh, in, 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 in Tarrant County, which is Fort Worth, we won countywide with Beto O'Rourke, picked up a couple of seats uh, there as well. And so 
the state is moving in, the, in trending in the direction of, of, of electing Democrats. There was a recent poll that showed um, three or four of the Democrats running for president uh, either tied or ahead of Mr. Donald Trump in the state of Texas. Mr. Biden is ahead by a, a few points against Mr. Trump in an election. In the entire time I've been involved in Texas Democratic Party politics, I've never seen that in a poll in the state of Texas. So, so uh, yeah. So Beto O'Rourke did almost defeat Ted Cruz in 2018, but he still fell short. So what do you think needs to happen for Democrats to actually turn Texas blue in 2020? Well, there needs to be a commitment by the National Party to to put resources into the state of Texas. I think the decision of the Democratic National Committee to put uh, the debate, the third debate, probably the most important debate that you're going to have uh, in Texas is is, is an example of uh, the National Party considering Texas as a battleground state. They understand that um, uh, this state is a state that, if you give it some loving and, and put some resources into it, um, it is moving in the direction of turning into a battleground state and turning into a blue state. Uh, all across uh, the board in the state of Texas, you've seen the trend of Democrats getting elected. Uh, and. For the first time, uh, the National Party is paying attention to us. They've targeted six new congressional seats in addition to the two that we picked up last time around. They're putting resources into the United States Senate uh, race. And you're going to see in this state, Democrats have been campaigning for the nomination since the beginning of the campaign season. We've had numerous Democrats coming into the state of Texas. I, I believe strongly, if you look at the numbers, this is going to be our year. All right, Ilberto Hinojosa, thank you. Still to come, will President Trump's public feud with four congresswomen help or hurt his 2020 campaign? We'll talk to Mr. Trump's press secretary next to talk about his re-election strategy. You're streaming Red and Blue. Let's listen now to Gail King's conversation with the four Democratic Congresswomen known as the Squad. It was their only joint interview since President Trump's racist tweets this weekend. According to the president yesterday, you all are people who hate our country with a passion. You hate Jewish people and you love enemies like Al Qaeda. You hear those statements coming from the president of the United States to describe you all and you think what? I think that America has always been a story and America has always been about the triumph of people who fight for everyone versus those who want to preserve rights for just a select few. And there is no bottom to the barrel of vitriol that will be used and weaponized to stifle those who want to advance rights for all people in the United States. We can talk about and spin out on hate, about hateful words, which are a predictable prompt by the occupant of this White House, and I call him that, not because I don't have respect for the Oval Office. But it sounds not like because you don't I'm have respect for the Oval Office when no, you no, call no, the I, President of the United States the occupant. No, because he is only occupying the space. He does not embody the principles, the responsibility, the grace, the integrity of a true president. And so for that reason, I'm not dishonoring the office. He does every day. Mm -hmm. This is a distraction. This is a disruption on our leading and legislating and governing on the issues of care and concern and consequence of the American people. What did you think when you heard the tweet? For me, I'm, I'm hearing about this from folks saying, did you see what the president just said? At the same time that I'm getting text messages from people saying, Rashida, what can we do? I heard ICE is now knocking on doors without warrants. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to represent my district. It was a very diverse district, 20 different ethnicities. And I'm trying to fight on their behalf, trying to make sure that they have a voice here. At the same time, I'm dealing with the biggest bully I've ever had to deal with in my lifetime uh, and trying to push back on that and trying to do the job that we all have been sent here mm -hmm. to do, which is centered around the people at home. Uh, this is a distraction. This is a person that, uh, uh, really wants to vilify, demonize not only immigrants, but even communities of color, uh, as many of my sisters here have been talking about. Uh, it is very much 
a, a, a distraction, getting us unfocused. It's interesting that you all use the word distraction. That he is that he is trying to um, he is trying to distract away from real issues. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been said about the four of you that the four of you are a distraction. Mm -hmm. That you're you're playing right into the president's hands. What do you say to people? And you have your critics too who say that you all are also a distraction. The insinuation of that question in itself is a distraction. I think he wants you to focus on that. Mm -hmm. And you should be asking, why is it that we are being criticized? Mm -hmm. What is it that we bring to mm -hmm. this body? I'll tell you what right? we bring. Exactly. We're an extension of a movement criticism. in our country that wants Medicare for all, right. that wants us to end mass incarceration, mm -hmm. that wants us to push back against the attacks on communities of color. I mean, I think all of us uh, have incredibly strong residents in our district that have spoke volumes in electing people like us. And we are a disruption to the business as usual. It's been Washington. But right? yeah. We were elected but for that also purpose. Just, just add yes. that each of us represent very different districts. Yes. Right. And each of us bring our unique and authentic voice to this body. We govern in our own way. What we are are four women who have an alignment of values, shared policy priorities. There is no insurgency here. There's nothing conspiratorial. There is no insurgency. There here. is no insurgency and there's nothing mm -hmm. conspiratorial. What we are are four lawmakers who happen to land in the same place on the same issue time and time again. I'm very confident that he will be reelected. In fact, I would venture to say that more women are going to come out and vote for Donald Trump in 2020 than 2016. That was the president's daughter-in-law, Lara Trump, last night at the official launch of the Women for Trump Coalition. Both the reelection campaign as well as the president appear to be focusing on women this week, only for very different reasons. As we've been reporting, Mr. Trump is publicly feuding with four congresswomen. The president began targeting the freshman progressives, all women of color, in a series of racist tweets over the weekend. Lara Trump was asked about the political implications from this fighting on the very voters she's trying to help court. Does that help you with women voters when he tweets things like that? Well, just to clarify, he never specifically specifically referenced a country. Go back to your country. He just said go back to where you came from. He, he said, though, he said the countries whose governments are a complete and total catastrophe, the worst, most corrupt and inept anywhere in the world. And if those women are from the United States, what country is he referring to then? Well, I, I don't know specifically about that. How does all of this help you win re-election right now if he's stoking racial divides in this country. Well, I'll tell you what does help us win, things like the First Step Act. This is the first president in the history of this country to pass comprehensive prison reform. What Donald Trump has done and his administration but has done will tensions. primarily help the, the black communities in this country, and you can't ignore that. For more on how Republicans are shaping their strategy ahead of 2020, let's go to our Washington bureau. Republican strategist Holly Turner joins me now. She's a partner at Stampede Consulting, as well as the former assistant administrator for the Small Business Administration under President Trump. Welcome to you. Thanks so much for joining us. I want to ask you about Lara Trump's response, since she did not directly answer the question. Do you think the president's attacks against these four congresswomen could hurt his campaign efforts. Yeah, I mean, the president is, uh, he'll, he'll never shy away from a fight. And um, it makes some of the Republican lawmakers a, a little nervous. And, and it could have some impact on them um, down the ballot. But look, we're a long ways from the election. And, and I think the president saw uh, the opportunity to, you know, call someone out for what he believed to be un-American values. Um, that person it, uh, is sitting at about 8% approval rate right now across the nation. And so I think he thought there was really not much harm in doing that. And, um, and from a political strategy uh, perspective, it was probably a pretty savvy move for him to make. And I know it makes people uncomfortable. Uh, the, the president's an equal opportunity offender. He says uh, what he believes about people to their face um, or not, if they're not there. But he, he's not going to pick out 
specific groups. He's happy to speak what's on his mind at any time. I, I do want to ask about the implications on down ballot races. We're seeing mm -hmm. Republicans up for re-election slow to criticize the president. Just last night, only four Republicans broke rank to vote in favor of the resolution condemning his comments. What kind of messaging can we expect to see used in congressional and Senate races around this issue? Yeah, I mean, I think the you'll see those uh, those other candidates and, and office holders stick to primarily what the campaign is going to be doing. Look, they're going to be talking about socialism a lot because that is what we've seen the Democrat Party uh, pivot to. Uh, I would not want to be in Nancy Pelosi's shoes right now. She's got a lot to manage. Uh, you know, she at one point was considered to be far left and, and, and pretty progressive in her, her thinking and her policy point of views. But uh, these freshmen have really given her um, a tough time this this session, and she's trying to rein in the party and, and bring it back to the center a little bit, and it's been very difficult for her. So I think you'll see those congressional districts, uh, those candidates in those districts focus on that. They're going to uh, def define the party as a whole, the Democratic Party as a whole, as very left of center and uh, almost to socialism. Well, last week, a woman candidate lost a congressional primary in North Carolina. Dr. Mm -hmm. Joan Perry was backed by a group called Winning for Women. Women. They're a first-of-their-kind organization dedicated to electing Republican women. However, Perry did not clinch the nomination. Do you think this Women for Trump coalition will be different than past efforts? Um, well, I, I don't think that that, you know, the Women for Trump effort is is kind of different than, than that race down um, in North Carolina. But I, I do think that it's what it's doing is it's putting a face to, to women uh, and to people who support the president. And we've seen the Democrats a lot try to uh, use identity politics, to, and, they, and they've successfully done that for, for many, many years now. And, and it's, a, and it's a, an interesting strategy, but they've uh, had women uh, be the face of their party and say that women are not supporting Republican values or Republican candidates. And so what I think you'll see the Trump campaign do is really focus on real stories from real women who have benefited from the president's uh, policies. I mean, women right now are primarily the financial decision makers in their family. And so you're going to see a lot of stories coming out of the campaign about women who are, are able to do different things for their kids and for their families. They feel more secure financially because of the tax cuts. You're going to hear from women who have not been able to have a, a job in the past. They've been unable to find work. Now they're going to have jobs. So you'll, you're going to hear real stories from real women. And what the campaign's going to do is they're going to normalize being a woman Trump supporter because there are a lot of us out there. And I think that it's going to be a successful strategy. Does the president distract from those stories that you mentioned when he tweets or as he did just a short time ago on the South Law and continued with the back and forth against these Democrats? Uh, he definitely keeps everyone on his campaign and on his staff on their toes. Look, he's he's done like no other president before and like no other candidate before, really. And so um, I think his staff and his team have really had to throw out the rule book and learn to just adapt. And, and you know, he's going to lead this effort, which in some ways is, is rather refreshing because we know we're getting what we see, right? This is not a scripted um rehearsed uh, candidate that we see we see what we see is what we get and so to some degree I think a lot of people are really responding to that because they like the authenticity uh, it's it's a little uncomfortable at times uh, he's definitely conflict oriented and, and that makes some people squirm a little bit but in the end uh, at least it's authentic all right Holly Turner for us in Washington Holly thanks very much for your time thanks Elaine we now know which Democratic presidential candidates will appear at the next debate. It'll include everyone who was on the stage in Miami, except for Congressman Eric Swalwell, who dropped out of the race. His position will be filled by Montana Governor Steve Bullock. Former Alaska Senator Mike Gravel also qualified for the debate based on his donor totals, but did not make the stage because of his lower polling numbers. We'll find out tomorrow night which 10 will appear on what night. The debates will take place in Detroit on July 30th and July 31st. CBSN will have highlights and complete coverage those nights. That does it for today. You can stream Red and Blue Monday to Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. More news after the break. You're streaming CBSN.